So, um, yes, today we are taking up the next gate in the 108 Gates of Dharma Illumination. Feels like we've been away from this text for a little while. Uh, so today we are going to take up the next gate, which is gate 57. And that gate statement reads, The four bases of mystical power are a gate of Dharma Illumination, for with them the body and mind is light. So, we are in the middle of this text, this 108 Gates of Dharma Illumination. Um, we're in the middle of a section that's describing the constituent factors of Bodhi, or awakening, right? So these are the elements of awakening. In early teachings, these things were linear steps on an extended kind of path toward deepening practice and eventually leaping off the wheel and reaching Nirvana. So there are 37 factors of Bodhi in seven different categories. <laughs> so, you know, when we look at these gate statements, we can see some of them they're taking individually and some of them they're grouping together, but altogether there are supposed to be 37 factors uh, of enlightenment. So earlier, the last few talks, we've looked at the four foundations of mindfulness. That's the first four. We've looked at the four exertions. That's the next four. So now we're at these four bases of mystical practice or what this translation calls mystical power. Um, some say supernormal power, supernatural power, spiritual power, <laughs> transcendental powers. Uh, they're translated a bunch of ways. But now we're at 9 through 12. We've done 1 through 8, now we're at 9 through 12. So there has been a significant shift in the understanding of these four bases of mystical or spiritual power from early Buddhism, early Buddhist practice through Dogen, and up to what our teachers are saying about this thing today. So let's start with the early teachings about these four bases. Then we'll see what Dogen had to say, and he had a lot to say <laughs> about this, um, and then maybe how we think about this today. So these four bases of, of mystical power can be said to be related to four kinds of jhana. So jhana has several meanings uh, depending on the context or who's talking. Um, it can mean training the mind, it can mean meditation, it can mean concentration, attention, thought, reflection, something happening <laughs> here, right? So meditation in early Buddhism was about letting go of being pulled around by what comes in through the sense gates. And we've talked about that before when we talked about sense gates. Um, somehow it was about becoming disenchanted with what was coming in through the sense gates, withdrawing from the senses in some ways so that there could be less distraction and more concentration and more balance. So just not getting pulled around by things we see, hear, touch, taste, smell, right? So for later schools, this is less about withdrawing from senses and more about fully entering into those experiences, right? I mean, we've seen that kind of shift, um, you know, seeing those sensory experiences for what they really are so that we're not attached to them, right? So we look clearly, look carefully at something comes in through the sense gates, we make judgments about that, we take action based on that. So for us, it's less about withdrawing from that experience and more about fully seeing, fully entering into and seeing what's happening there. So the four jhanas are stages of meditation, if you will, in the early practice. So in the first one, you start letting go of those sense desires and the impulse toward unwholesomeness in trying to chase after things you want or run away from things you don't want, right? So whatever comes in through the senses, of course, craving and aversion arises immediately. So in the first state, you start letting go of that clinging and craving and aversion. In the second one, you have mental concentration and some kind of serenity. In the third one, joy and equanimity start to arise. And in the fourth, you transcend both suffering and joy. That's the Reader's Digest <laughs> version of these four stages. You can read lots and lots and lots about them. But that's the progression, right? To, to let go of what's happening in the senses, to gain some serenity, some balance, um, and out of that to experience the joy which is already there, right? Joy is naturally arising. So there's a real sense of progression along a path um, or following a curriculum, sort of, if you will, in this early practice. Taking up the Eightfold Path is supposed to be a preparation for meditation. So if we're doing right livelihood, you know, if we're thinking about what we say, if we have right view and we understand the nature of suffering, and all of those things are a preparation for or a support for um, meditation practice. So we can see how these things are kind of linear. Uh, once you've gotten your life in order, <laughs> and once you settle down by beginning to take up this Eightfold Path, then you can start making progress in your sitting uh, towards Nirvana. Um, and again, you start with the four foundations of mindfulness. 
that we talked about before. Then you add the four exertions. Then you, you, know, you progress through the four jhanas. And if you do things right, you may develop some kind of mystical power. So what are these bases of mystical power that we're talking about? There are four kinds of concentration. So the first one is intention or purpose, desire, zeal, right? Some kind of thing like that. It might seem strange to find desire among the bases of support for manifesting awakening because we're always being told that being in the grip of desire, not being in the grip of desire is important in our practice. And yet here comes desire as one of the actual bases. So this kind of desire is aspiration or intention, right? Some kind of direction toward practice. We wanna carry out the, the four exertions that we talked about before, right? So, you know, let it, making sure that wholesomeness is arising, getting rid of things that are not wholesome, right? Um, so we're cultivating and maintaining wholesomeness. We're abandoning or refraining from unwholesomeness. So we want to do those things. We have some aspiration, some intention to work on those things and to live in that way. So we've decided we're gonna practice and we wanna put some energy into that practice and focus on it and make room for it in our lives. So we concentrate on that direction and purpose and make some kind of commitment to what we're doing. This is the kind of desire that we're talking about here, right? Intention, aspiration. The second one is effort or energy or will. And this one is about making a real effort in the long term to move away from unskillfulness and to move towards skillfulness. So even when we get scared, even when we get discouraged, even when we're fatigued or exasperated <laughs> by our practice, somehow we keep going, right? We keep putting energy into it. So it's not only about our activity or our energy level, it's also about, also about diligence or perseverance or courage, right? Stick to itiveness. The second base is related to right effort, of course, on the Eightfold Path. So if we're kind of half-hearted in our practice, and we don't stick to it, then somehow unwholesomeness starts to creep back in. So, you know, we may let go of something unwholesome, we may reverse some unskillful habit. And if we think we're done, and if we sort of stop paying attention to our practice, then of course, those things can start to creep back in. So that kind of stick to uh, is important. We can forget what Buddha taught. We get out of the habit of sitting, we can be influenced by unwholesome things around us or unskillful things that are happening around us and we can start to slip, right? Backsliding starts to set in. Um, so this, I think, is one of the reasons why Sangha is important. We need some regular contact with other people who are doing this crazy practice. Um, we can see other people practicing and they can support our own practice and encourage our own practice. Practicing by ourselves is hard. You know, it's like we knew that before the pandemic and boy, do we really know it now. <laughs> it's not easy on our own. Uh, not only to get on the cushion every day, but just to remember what Buddha taught and remember what our aspiration is and to uh, have the, um, and to be encouraged, right? Not to get discouraged in our practice. So, you know, there's a lot of delusion in the world. We can feel a lot of pressure to go along. Um, so one of the uh, reasons I think that this Sangha has stayed together is that we come together in arenas like this, right? Support and, and encourage each other. So the third of these bases is consciousness or mind or thoughts. Um, this is like state of mind or mindset, right? This is the chitta, the, the Sanskrit here is chitta. This is the chitta of bodhicitta, right? Away, arousing bodhi mind. This is not intellectual mind, um, sort of academic thinking mind. Um, it's important as a base for practice because our mind state can be out of alignment with our aspiration, right? I mean, deep in our hearts, we can have a strong aspiration to practice, but if on that day I'm discouraged or I'm anxious or I'm distracted or something, mind state can be out of alignment with aspiration. So if there are two things that are going off in different directions, we kind of have a problem, right? I mean, we've probably all experienced that. Gee, I signed up for Sashin. <laughs> I had an aspiration to be there, so, you know, I'm going to be there because I said I'd be there, but boy, what's going on up here doesn't feel like it fits. It doesn't feel like I'm in the right place to do this thing. So it can be, you know, difficult to practice. Or for instance, I really want to live in Buddha's way, but I fall, hindrance, uh, fall prey to hindrances or I develop some kind of doubts about my practice or I'm just too bored or too lethargic or something to get on the cushion. So, I mean, we've all been there, right? <laughs> so mind state 
is important. It's important to recognize when we're running into hindrances, right? So that we can do something about it. And we've talked about that several weeks ago. So chitta can really lead us astray, right? It can either be uh, a terrific support for our practice. Gee, you know, mentally I'm in a really good place to sit down and practice. Or it can really be something that can deter us, right? Pull us off track, um, you know. If it's in alignment with our aspiration, it's a real source of strength. Um, you know, so taking care of mind state is important. Watching our mind state is a real exercise, I think, in understanding impermanence, right? Because the mind state of today <laughs> might not be what we felt yesterday. Five minutes from now, it might change. Um, you know, I just sat Sashin for two weekends in a row. <laughs> I had a chance to watch this thing happening. You know, the state of mind at 4 a.m., um, maybe on the second day, is not the state of mind, you know, at lunchtime or at 7 p.m. or when it's time to go to sleep. So, you know, you watch the light change during the day. You can watch your mind state change during the day if you're sitting 14 periods a day <laughs> for several days in a row. Um, so, you know, your ad attitude changes, your outlook changes. Gee, I'm happy to be here. Gee, I wish I wasn't here. I've got things to do. Boy, what an opportunity, right? We go back and forth. Maybe even within the same Zazen period, <laughs> right? So mind state is, is important here. The fourth base is investigation, discrimination, wisdom, something like that, right? We have to be able to distinguish between wholesomeness and unwholesomeness, or skillfulness and unskillfulness. Uh, you know, energy and exertion are fine, but are they in support of something which is real and good and wholesome and skillful or not? You know, we can pour a lot of energy into unwholesomeness when we get pulled off track. So, you know, we need to be able to see the difference and recognize the difference. So we can feel happy and satisfied in our practice, which feels great and seems like a really good thing, but is that because we're letting go of suffering or is it because we're feeding our egos and feeling like wizards because we're going to develop some kind of you know mystical power and uh, be better than the practitioner next to us, right? So all of those things kind of get tangled up. So we have to apply some discernment about what we're doing about our motivation, about, you know, the effects of our actions and all of those things. We need to apply some wisdom to our practice. So it's helpful to have teachers and Sangha brothers and sisters to point out where we might be taking a wrong turn, um, going off the rails. But ultimately, we have to do the work. So yes, somebody else can apply some discrimination to our practice and say, you know, that thing you're doing, maybe you want to... We ultimately have to be the ones that do that work, right? Uh, so we can we can certainly uh, take help from others, but our own discrimination, our own wisdom is important here. So, you know, we have to be the ones that see our suffering and see how that arises. We have to be the ones that see where we've done something unskillful and either how do we fix it? How do we prevent it from happening again? So those are the four bases. Um, we can see the way they're interconnected in supporting our practice. Um, you know, we have some intention or some direction, we make some effort toward that, we pay attention to the mind state with which we're carrying out our practice activities, um, and that's both the cause and result of our practice, right? <laughs> if I'm feeling good about my practice, my mind state's doing something, and on the basis of my mind state, I'm doing something, right? Um, and, you know, we determine what's wholesome and what's skillful and what isn't. So if we do all these things, the gate statement says the body and mind will be light. So other translations of that might be easy or simple or gentle, right? So we kind of get the feeling about what's happening in the body and mind. Uh, we're not obstructed. We're not constricted. We're not full of hindrances and extra layers of clinging and craving and aversion and chasing and avoiding and all that stuff, right? So we're less likely to act out in harmful ways. If we feel like we have some equanimity and some balance and some clarity, um, we're just less likely to do harmful stuff. So that's what this gate statement is talking about when it says body and mind are light. We're sort of not held back. We're not weighed down. We're, we're not obstructed, right, in what we're doing. So what are these mystical spiritual powers that this gate is talking about that we're supposed to be cultivating or getting from these bases? Well, so the Puba Sutra says, when the four bases of spiritual power have been developed and cultivated in this way, a bhikkhu wields the various kinds of spiritual power. Having been one, he becomes many. Having been many, he becomes one. He appears and vanishes. He goes unhindered through a wall, through a rampart, through a mountain, as through space. He dives in and out of the earth as though it were water. 
He walks on water without sinking or as though it were earth. Seated cross-legged, he travels in space like a bird with his hand. He touches and strokes the moon and sun, so powerful and mighty. He exercises mastery with the body as far as the Brahma world. So that's quite a list. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen anybody do these things, but these are the spiritual powers according to early teachings that, that we can cultivate. So again, early Buddhist point of view. Doga's list is a bit different, which we'll see in a little while. Um, he had a lot to say about spiritual powers in several places in his writing, which we might find a bit surprising actually, but there's some context for that. So in all of his writings, in all of Dogen's writings, his point is this, having spiritual powers is all well and good. If we're practicing these four bases, if we're diligently doing what we need to do to live in Buddha's way, and somehow we cultivate some kind of mystical powers, that's terrific, but it's nothing other than awakening, right? Uh, the way we manifest awakening moment by moment by moment is the ultimate spiritual power. The other things are whatever they are, but we need to not get stuck there. So certainly spiritual powers, he says, are not going to move us toward understanding the Dharma. So it's not as though we need to cultivate these things. We don't need to be able to fly through the air in order to understand the Dharma. And in fact, as we'll see, sometimes that's not only is it not helpful, it can actually be a hindrance. So if you wake up tomorrow and you're able to see through a wall, <laughs> that's all well and good. Don't, don't mistake that for some mark of attainment or you know that that in itself is awakening. He says we need to have some discrimination about this thing. So Dogen may have been responding when he's writing these things. And he, as I say, he writes about this in a bunch of different places. He may have been responding to the practices he was seeing around him. Uh, where people were really going out of their way to develop some kind of magical powers and thinking that this was going to move them along somehow in their spiritual practice. Shugendo, for instance, was happening around him. Um, Shugendo was a practice of, it, it's a, a kind of a mixture of Buddhist practice and folk practices. There's some Shinto in there, some ancient sort of Japanese folk practices. Uh, so Shu is practice and Gen is this kind of supernatural power that one might gain by practicing in the mountains, do is way. So, you know, people around him are doing ascetic practices, <clears throat> excuse me, like going up into the mountains for a long time, not eating very much, doing a lot of hiking or walking many, many miles in a day. Uh, and they were doing this as a means of purification. So the idea was you could purify body and mind and attain some kind of powers. Um, so Dogen says activities like these are all well and good, but they don't actually move us toward liberation from suffering. So, of course, the first place we meet Dogen talking about special powers is in the Fukanza Zengi. At least that was the first place for me. It may have been the first place for you. Um, he lists a bunch of examples of awakening stories from the Dento, uh, Denkoroku and then says these cannot be understood by discriminative thinking, much less can they be known through the practice of supernatural powers. So you know, when we first encounter the Fukanza Zengi and we read this, we just kind of go, yeah, yeah. Well, it turns out there's some context <laughs> for him talking about supernatural powers because people were out there trying to do this. Um, you know, so when we read these examples of famous awakening stories of our ancestors, which is what the Denkoroku is, um, he says, and we can't understand it by intellect, by academics, and we also can't understand it by you know, some kind of magic. Awakening is not magic, and it's also not an intellectual practice, and so there has to be something else. And of course, he goes on to talk about zazen, <laughs> and and how you know zazen is our manifestation of that understanding. So he says, you know, special powers are not necessary; they're not especially helpful in seeing what Buddha and our ancestors saw. It's the zazen that gets us to you know see what it puts us in the place to see what Buddhas and ancestors saw. Um, you know, he says we need to sit zazen for ourselves rather than relying on special powers or something else. Um, so that may be the first place we encounter him talking about spiritual practice, but he wrote about it, as I say, elsewhere, probably four or five different places in the Ehe Koroku. He's telling stories, he's talking about this. It must have been a big deal in his time. <laughs> so we don't hear about it so much in modern Western practice. Um, maybe we do, I don't. Uh, I don't hear my teachers talking about this a lot. So I want to share a couple of his writings from Ehe Koroku about this, um, just to give us some flavor about 
what he's talking about. So here's the first one. Suppose, moreover, that you have supernatural powers to transform yourself and move the great thousandfold worlds, and you can dry up vast oceans, can fly in the sky like a cloud, can walk on water as if on ground, and your body generates fire and water, wind and clouds, and radiant light. Still, in terms of the great matter of the causal conditions for the appearance of Buddhas, you have not seen the ultimate Buddha Dharma, even in a dream. Your supernatural power, I'm sorry, such supernatural powers and so forth, as mentioned above, are simply the affair in the realms of the two vehicles of listeners and practica Buddhas and of those outside the way, and this is just the livelihood in the demon's cave. How can such people understand this wondrous Dharma of the unsurpassed awakening of the Tathagatas? So this teaching is making reference to the Lotus Sutra, uh, where the Sutra says the single great matter of the causal condition for the appearance of Buddhas is opening up and demonstrating and realizing and helping others to enter into the insight of Buddha. So it's, it's seeing what Buddha saw that is the causal condition for the appearance of Buddhas. It's not supernatural powers and people flying through the air and walking on water and all that stuff. Um, in other words, to put ourselves right in the middle of awakening with our practice is what's important here. So we're not gonna conjure up Buddhas by developing some special powers or you know, doing some kind of special magic that's somehow outside the workings of this one unified reality. So I may have mentioned here before, even using a word like supernatural is kind of interesting. It's kind of a problem uh, because it applies there's something outside of nature. So supernatural is something which is above nature, outside of nature. And yet we know there's nothing outside of this one unified reality. There's nothing outside of Buddha's way. So when we call something supernatural, right away we kind of have a problem, right? Because <laughs> somehow it's outside of the workings of this one unified reality, which sort of can't be. So we already know uh, maybe we need to look again. <laughs> maybe we need to think again. So um, we're also not going to achieve the cessation of outflows, if you will, or the body and mind that are light and easy and unobstructed. Um, like the gate statement says, by using some kind of magic. So here is another teaching from the Ehe Koroku. A capable master must be endowed with the six spiritual powers. The first is the power to go anywhere. Second is the power to hear everywhere. Third is the power to know others' minds. Fourth is the power to know previous lives. Fifth is the power to see everywhere. Sixth is the power to extinguish outflows or attachments or delusions, right? So supposedly, these first five, traditionally, anybody could achieve. The sixth one, to, un to, to know when, uh, to have the power to, to extinguish outflows or to know when somebody has extinguished delusion is only the province of Buddhas. So Dogen lists these things. Everyone, do you want to see the power to go anywhere? The teacher Dogen raised his fist. Do you want to see the power to know others' minds? Dogen let one of his legs hang down from the seat. Do you want to see the power of hearing everywhere? Dogen snapped his fingers once. Do you want to see the power of knowing previous lives? Dogen raised his whisk. Do you want to see the power of seeing everywhere? Dogen drew a circle in the air with his whisk. Do you want to see the power of extinguishing outflows? Dogen drew a single horizontal line, which is the character for one, a single horizontal line with his whisk and said, Although this is so, ultimately six times six is sixteen is thirty-six. Ultimately six times six is thirty-six. So he's describing all these powers and he's doing very obvious everyday things. So the six by six is thirty-six is simple math, right? It's like everybody knows six times six is thirty-six. So these spiritual powers are simply everyday things, everyday activities. Also, the other way to look at that is also, you know, there are many powers beyond 36. So a Buddha has innumerable spiritual powers simply by virtue of awakening. And if we're all, you know, if Buddha nature is already here and awakening is already here, then we also have innumerable spiritual powers um, simply by virtue of that. So our everyday activities, hanging one leg down from the seat, you know, raising a fist, doing something, is, is a manifestation of spiritual power. So he's saying it's not something out there. It's not something magical we need to cultivate in some world other than this one. It is simply the moment by moment expression of our own awakening in what we're doing, just carrying out our daily activities. So third example from the Ehe Kodoku. Buddhas do not appear in the world by depending on the 16 especially excellent meditation methods. 
which generate the spiritual powers. Even when ordinary people with sharp capacity practice these kinds of meditation, the cessation of outflows does not occur. When Tathagatas expound the teaching, the cessation of outflows does occur. So, uh, 16 methods is, he's referring to 16 meditation techniques um, in early Buddhism from the Anap Anapanasati, I can never say that properly, Anapanasati Sutta. So, um, he's saying the practice of Buddhas is not directed toward gaining some exalted state, becoming some exotic person with some kind of exotic abilities, unlike these early special meditation techniques, which were very much directed at developing some kind of spiritual power. So he says, you know, that's all well and good, um, but the practice of Buddhas is something else. So again, Dogen frequently says, understanding the Dharma, completely manifesting Buddha nature in our moment by moment activity is the same as having supernatural powers. We don't need to develop the ability to you know, walk on water or dive into the earth. Um, so they're nothing special. We would like to think that having supernatural powers makes us special or makes you know, something about those powers as exotic or different. He says it's nothing special. It's simply our everyday life. So although we want, might want to cultivate some magical abilities, Maybe the reason we came into the practice was to develop some kind of special ability. Um, you know, we have to think about why we feel like that's important. You know, if we want to be wizards, probably we want to do that to impress people or, you know, to have power of some kind or, you know, in worst case scenario to have uh, take advantage of people, have influence over people. So, you know, we get to look at, okay, why do we want to be special? <laughs> Why do I want to be able to, you know, wiggle my fingers and have something amazing happen? Um, you know, there's some kind of grasping there. Um, you know, seeking after these things with some kind of unwholesome motivation, of course, is a problem. Um, you know, our natural, natural functioning in everyday life, having dropped off body and mind, which is the way Dogen would put that, right? Dropping off body and mind. Uh, letting go of three poisons read anger and ignorance, just doing what needs to be done in this moment, which in our wisdom and compassion we can see, um, that is a greater thing, according to Dogen. That's, that's where our aspiration should lie, not in achieving a special state and then stopping and saying, now I've got something. He says, you know, that's fine, but you know, aim for what you really need to be aiming for, <laughs> which is to live in Buddha's way and to manifest awakening, wisdom and compassion. So previously we've talked about Dogen calling the six sense organs, six instances of prajna. Uh, when we talked about um, sense gates, we talked about sometimes those sense gates are sources of delusion or distraction because what comes in, we immediately decide it's pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. We grab onto something about that. We take some action, right? Dogen says, well, okay, but Six sense gates are actually six instances of prajna. Uh, there are six kinds of wisdom. Uh, so that means he, you know, he's also saying they are also six marvelous spiritual abilities. Simply what comes in through the six sense gates, even though it feels very ordinary to us, and even though you know, we have to be careful, he says that alone, that even, is six instances of some kind of spiritual power. So Dogen wrote a whole fascicle on spiritual powers. Oh, there's a whole fascicle of the Shobogenzo about this. It's called Jinzu. Um, it maybe isn't one of the fascicles we know so well or that gets talked about so much. So I just want to kind of summarize here what he says in this fascicle. He says that the unsurpassed spiritual ability is, I love the way he puts this, our 3,000 acts of a morning and our 800 acts of an evening, which we take as the normal state of things. So just the simple day-to-day, moment-by-moment, the, the 3,000 things and the 800 things, of course, means all the things we do. It's, you know, those numbers are not special. Each moment-by-moment-by-moment by moment thing we do uh, is unsurpassed spiritual ability because it is a complete manifestation of awakening. So he says supernatural powers are supposed to arise when we become Buddhas. So like, you know, we've, we've gone along this path somehow and become Buddhas and then spiritual powers, we somehow have these pure spiritual powers. Um, but if that's true, he, it, he says, you know, we will never recognize that we actually have spiritual powers. Why? Because Buddhas don't know they're Buddhas. Because Buddhas are not separate from awakening. And if that's true, if Buddhas don't even see awakening, how are Buddhas going to see spiritual powers? <laughs> 
right? I mean, there they are, but there's no separation. So we're not saying, oh, there's a being which possesses spiritual powers, and we'll get to that in a minute. How can there be separation? There can't be a spiritual power which is separate from what we're doing. Um, the powers are there before we're Buddhas. They're there after we're Buddhas because awakening is already here and Buddha nature is already here. So it is not a case of we need to cultivate something or gain something which we don't already have. That sounds familiar, right? <laughs> That's a teaching we hear um, all the time. So in this fascicle, Dogen tells a story about a teacher who wakes up in the morning and gets out of bed and calls out to his disciple and the disciple brings him a basin of water to wash his face and another disciple brings him a cup of tea and this teacher says all the everyday things that we all just did are practices of pra uh, practicing these marvelous spiritual abilities. So simply waking up in the morning, rolling over, washing your face, somebody bringing you a cup of tea is completely a manifestation of these marvelous spiritual abilities. These are things we do all the time, right? So Dogen makes a distinction between the teachings and practices of early Buddhism as they're related to mystical powers and says his view is different. So here's Dogen once again <laughs> turning something on its head. He says, yeah, there's these early teachings. Here's what they say about mystical powers. My view is different. I want to tell you something else. Um, he says, you know, what I'm going to tell you here is the true wisdom passed down by Buddhas and ancestors. So again, he's, a, he's equating these things to awakening. It's awakening that's been, you know, something that's been the transmitted down, you know, down the line. He says, this is part of that thing. So he tells us when it comes to these powers, not to practice like the early Buddhists or like non-Buddhists or like academics, which is really interesting. I mean, he's like calling out these things and saying, don't practice like these people. <laughs> what we're doing here is something else. You know, maybe what they're doing is fine, but what we're doing is something else. So, um, he tells the story of this teacher waking up with the tea and the basin and all um, again in the Ehe Koroku. So he's telling the same story in more than one place. Um, and in the Ehe Koroku, he says, the wondrous transformation of spiritual powers are simply bringing a basin of water and making tea. So, you know, he's, he's really, this feels important. He's telling the story in more than one place and he's making this point in more than one way. Simply doing the 3,000 things of the morning and the 800 things of the evening is a complete manifestation of spiritual power. So Dogen says even if we gain these mystical powers, they are limited. Unlike awakening, these powers themselves are limited. They don't compare to the scope of awakening, which there's no outside edge of that thing, right? So he says these powers, we can define them, we can talk about them, we can draw lines around them. I'm, you know, they're exercised by not everybody. They can't possibly compare. Um, they can't possibly be a yardstick. So he says that's not really the way to understand the true nature of self, which is kind of what our project is, right? So spiritual powers will not tell you who you are, <laughs> will not point you toward um, the true nature of self. So he doesn't negate the potential for developing some kind of spiritual power. He's not saying it's not possible. Um, but he says it's not the goal of our practice, and it's maybe not even particularly helpful because we can get stuck there, right, Grasp, grasping these things. So he says such things as the lesser spiritual abilities do also exist, enveloped within the capacity of this greater spiritual ability. The greater marvelous spiritual ability is in contact with the lesser spiritual ability, but the lesser spiritual abilities are not aware of the greater marvelous spiritual ability. So he says within awakening there might be special powers. But the people who are stuck only at special powers, you know, don't see the larger awakening, right? They don't see what Buddhas and ancestors actually saw. So he's saying to us, don't get stuck there. <laughs> Even if you wake up tomorrow and you can hear what's happening on the other side of the world, like don't get stuck there because that's a small piece of something which is much larger. So um, we need to be careful about thinking we've achieved something, right? To, to go for some special magical ability and then stop there and think we've got it, we've achieved something. He says, don't get stuck there. So he describes how limited these powers are, um, you know, and therefore they can't be an end goal. They shouldn't be mistaken for awakening, right? They are all tainted by their practice being considered as separate from enlightenment and because they are confined to some time or some place. They reside in life, but do not manifest after one's death. They belong to oneself, but do not belong to someone else. Although they may manifest in this land of ours, they may not manifest in all other countries. 
though, in some, though some may manifest them without trying, others cannot manifest them when they would. So if we consider uh, mystical powers as separate from awakening or as a stepping stone to awakening, he says we've made a mistake because they're not separate. Um, and then he points out that a person using these powers is limited to a time and a place. So, you know, such powers belong to one person and not to another, right? We, you know, we're always hearing about Buddha nature, you know, all sentient beings without exception are Buddha nature, he says, right? So Buddha nature is already there, awakening is already there, permeates everything across time and space, but a spiritual power, he says, is limited, so it can't possibly be the same thing. Uh, you know, we need to, to have some wisdom around that, see around that. So if we're practicing in order to gain some kind of advantage, uh, some kind of magical power for ourselves, then of course our motivation is questionable. Um, and he says we also just don't understand awakening, which is not limited to one time, one place, one person, right? So we need to see clearly about that. Now we come to a very famous image, which I'm sure you all know. The marvelous spiritual ability manifests its enlightened functioning in our carrying water and in our handling firewood. And I'm sure everyone's going, oh yeah, <laughs> right? Um, Dogen is quoting this verse by lay disciple Ho'on. I'm sure you've heard this teaching, you know, that the very ordinariness of our moment by moment life is what's important in our practice. So chop wood, carry water, right? Everyone's heard chop wood, carry water. Here it is, <laughs> Dogen is quoting this verse. So Dogen says, you need to thoroughly explore this principle through your training. Now, of course, he's talking to monks. He's talking to clergy in training or people who are training in his training temple. Um, but we can, we don't need to think that that means it's not relevant for us in our day-to-day -day life, even though we're not in the training temple. He's saying we need to do this thing through our activity of body and mind, right? It's not something to study with the intellect, it's something to experience in carrying out our day-to-day -day activity and our you know everyday tasks. So he says sometimes we do things for ourselves, sometimes we do things for other people, sometimes we're not even aware that our daily tasks are manifestations of spiritual power or of awakening, but that he says that doesn't make them any the less marvelous, right? It doesn't make them any the less um, important, powerful, right? although we need to not have some idea about that, simply bringing the basin of water, simply bringing the cup of tea, simply rolling over in bed, he says, is the manifestation of some kind of marvelous spiritual ability. Why? Because it's a manifestation of awakening. So it doesn't have to be special. He says we don't need to compare our mundane sort of everyday stuff with some kind of exotic magical ability. So he says, spiritual powers arise along with that which is beyond anything our consciousness can recognize and they abide in that which is beyond anything our consciousness can recognize, and they take their true refuge in that which is beyond anything our consciousness can recognize. The ever-changing characteristics of the marvelous spiritual ability of Buddhas have no connection with something short or something long. So in all seriousness, how can one possibly undertake to evaluate them simply by making comparisons? He says we don't need to hold up awakening and magic and say one is better than the other. It says, you know, not, not necessary to compare. There is no useful yardstick there, <laughs> right? There can't be short or long. There can't be inside, outside. There's no useful yardstick. We don't need to make a comparison. So then Dogen considers what it means to possess spiritual powers. How is it possible to possess these things? Of course, we can grasp them. We can be hindered by them, <laughs> right? Uh, just like everything else for which we have some craving and clinging. Is it really possible to own powers like that, or possess powers like that, or is that just an obstruction, that idea? Um, does it put artificial limits on something which is not actually limited, right? So he quotes uh, Hyakujo Eikai when he says, when the six sense gates leave no trace, we call this the six marvelous spiritual abilities. So here we're hearkening back to six instances of prajna, right? Simply, at this very moment, when we are smoothly going on, unhindered by all the various material and immaterial things that arise, and having brought to an end our dependency on our discriminatory thinking, then this too is called the six marvelous spiritual abilities. Not claiming these marvelous spiritual abilities as one's own is what we call not possessing spiritual abilities. So if I'm not clinging to my magical power and saying, this is mine, and it makes me special, you know, that's important. 
So Dogen goes on to describe some characteristics of bodhisattvas who may have actually developed these magical powers or these spiritual powers. He says they're no longer dependent only on discriminative thinking, right? So they're not stuck only with what's happening here. They may have those powers, but they may not use them. They are applying wisdom and compassion to know when is it skillful for me to do these things and when is it not. There are plenty of stories in the tradition, right, about bodhisattvas appearing in various forms in order to help people. Um, you know, they appear like regular people and then at the end of the story you'll find out, oh, you know, they were doing some kind of magical thing and they were actually bodhisattvas. So there's a real element of skillfulness here, right? If I have some ability, I need to know when to use it and when not to use it. And so bodhisattvas with these powers may have them and never use them, which I think is kind of interesting. So in other words, they're not stuck in the karmic conditions around their powers. They accept that these things exist and that they may have some ability, um, but they're not stuck with um, some idea about what that means for them. Um, they see them from the perspective of the universal self, we might say, rather than from the individual self. Right? So rather than saying, I'm special, I'm important, I have magical powers, I'm going to use them for something, which is my own agenda, they see that from the perspective of one unified reality, universal self. Right? They see the larger picture around that. So Dogen tells us not to mistake meaningful feasting on externals for the daily behavior of returning to one's true home. Isn't that interesting? Feasting on the uh, meaningless feasting on externals. Wow. So, you know, not to get caught up in the limited view of feeding the ego. Um, and, you know, we might think this only means spiritual power like, you know, flying through the air, but it can also mean, have I internalized and memorized a lot of quotes so that I can spout these things and impress people? Or, you know, am I so concerned about the way that I bow because I want to make sure people know, you know, I really know what I'm doing. Or I make sure to wear the rock suit because golly, I want to look like, you know, I'm an elder in this community. It can be lots of things that we get stuck in, right? That on the surface are terrific. It's great that we bow. It's great that we wear a rock suit. You know, it's great that we do Dharma study. And then, you know, are we turning that around sometimes <laughs> for a less than useful purpose? So, you know, he says we need to not get caught up with limited view. Um, instead, we need to respond to this moment by using whatever we have, whatever spiritual ability we have, but not to be hindered or obstructed by that because it's so easy to get tangled up. So we don't hear so much about mystical or transcendental powers from our contemporary teachers. <laughs> not something we talk about a lot. Um, I certainly know practitioners who live in the magic world, and uh, for them these things are important, but in general it might be difficult for modern Western practitioners to kind of think that teachings about supernatural powers are credible or relevant. Um, so maybe we don't hear so much about them um, in contemporary times, but guess what? All of our three immediate ancestors had something to say. <laughs> so Sawaki Roshi says, there are bodhisattvas without magical abilities. He's got this in quotes, without magical abilities. These are bodhisattvas who have entirely forgotten words like practice or satori. Bodhisattvas without wonderful powers, bodhisattvas who are immeasurable, bodhisattvas who are not interested in their name and fame. So he's hearkening back to what we just heard from Dogen, right? Um, there may be bodhisattvas in the world who have all these wonderful abilities. Uh, they don't claim them, cling to them, have ideas about them. They simply use what they have to respond wisely and compassionately to whatever's in front of them at that moment. Um, so elsewhere, Sawaki Roshi says, what's called having magical powers doesn't mean anything more than having a facial expression that isn't muddled. <laughs> I think that's great, right? Having magical powers doesn't mean anything more than having a facial expression that's not muddled. In other words, we have clarity. We're seeing clearly. We have wisdom and compassion. You know, we're not hindered by whatever we think we can do. Um, that alone is the bodhisattva without having magical powers. So it's good to remember that the focus of this gate, if we hearken back to the original gate statement, the focus of the gate is on the bases of mystical power and not on the magical ability itself. Um, it's tempting to jump straight to, cool, if I do enough practice, you know, I can float in the air and I can walk on water. Um, maybe so but it's not enough. What we've heard today from our ancestors and our teachers is that's great, but it's not enough. So uh, we have to 
think about why are there why is there focus on these bases you know in addition to mentioning these various powers so the point of these things is they support our sitting practice right things like intention energy diligence perseverance um, concentration these are things that support our sitting practice um, you know these are what allow the body and mind to be light right easy gentle simple um, in other words, th this is what allows us to move freely through the world as bodhisattvas, liberating beings from suffering, which is the project, right? Without getting caught by three poisons and our ideas about things and our delusions about things. So whatever else happens is fine, but whether or not we can read people's minds or you know hear things that happen on the other side of the world is not a measure of the effectiveness of our zazen. So here we are again at Zazen is good for nothing, right? So, you know, if we have some special ability, that's great, but it's not a yardstick we should be using to measure Zazen or measure our practice. So Uchiyama Roshi says, the attitude of the practitioner practicing Zazen as a Mahayana Buddhist teaching never means to attempt to artificially create some new self by means of practice, nor should it be aiming at decreasing delusion and finally eliminating it altogether. We practice Zazen neither aiming at having a special mystical experience nor trying to gain greater enlightenment. Zazen as true Mahayana teaching is always the whole self just truly being the whole self, life truly being life. So he's simply reiterating what we've heard from Dogen and others, right? Um, same message again. Our practice is not nearly so linear as it was in early Buddhist teaching. Uh, but the important message is still that we need to cultivate our practice, right? If we're going to let go of three poisons, uh, if we're going to be skillful in the world, if we're going to liberate ourselves and others from suffering, you know, those four bases are important to set direction and have some energy and follow through, right? So just wishing it to be so, well, I wish today when I wake up somehow <laughs> that I had some ability or that I could see clearly or that I had more wisdom and compassion than I do. Simply making a wish like that is maybe an important like first step. Maybe it's an aspiration, but it's not enough. We've got to get on the cushion, right? We've got to do the work. We've got to do the Zazen work and study. Um, so trying to become a wizard is fine, <laughs> but maybe that's our idea. Maybe we need to look carefully at what's going on there. So, you know, we can't develop spiritual powers in order to aid us somehow in our practice. It's not going to result in somehow seeing what Buddhas and ancestors saw. Um, we can't make developing those powers sort of the goal of our practice. Um, so Hojasan says, I'll give him the last word. Our practice doesn't have a mystical, mysterious or magical power to clear away all delusions. But like the raindrops, we sit moment by moment, day after day, year after year, and this sitting generates the power to erode a rock. Our effort is like raindrops. It doesn't create change in one day or a few days or a few years, but if we just keep doing it when conditions are ripe, it happens. So what would you like to say or ask or offer about magical powers? <laughs> and the results of our practice and whatever might be arising for you. And please unmute yourself so we can hear you when you offer what you'd like to say. Sawyer's got his hand up, please. Ah, good morning. Uh... I have a different, I'm looking at my phone today, so it's kind of a mystical experience. <laughs> um, I'm really, really intriguing, different kind of talk um, and fascinating to think about. And um, I'm really interested in, in Dogen's um, sort of ability to say maybe these these sort of mystical powers exist and that's fine but they're not the focus of practice um, and comparing that into contemporary sort of western buddhism where we have a kind of built-in skepticism of anything supernatural or mystical or spiritual. And I'm wondering if, if that might be 
if that very skepticism might be itself a hindrance to to what we're actually trying to do yeah that's really perceptive and you know i've i've run into this before in other sanghas i've been in where there were people i mean i described them i'm not being um uh unkind when i'm just saying they live in the magic world they see the magic world and you know i'm not someone who does and so i appreciate their worldview is different than mine um and i i i'm not here to say that spiritual powers exist or not but i certainly think that anytime we cut off the possibility for something we limit our uh our ability to see the reality so just like Buddha never said, there were things he never talked about. You know, people would say to him, you know, is there life after death? And are there, is there this and that? And he would say, you know, I just teach about suffering, man. I'm just here to tell you about suffering. <laughs> I'm here to tell you the Four Noble Truths. And anything beyond that, it's like, I don't go there. So I kind of think, you know, there, there is a, a theme or a strain in our teachings that come down to us where we can kind of look back at that and say, you know, like Dogen says, yeah, maybe there's spiritual powers. I don't know. I mean, I live in a time where people are cultivating these things. I'm not here to say that they're not there, but let's stay focused, you know, on what we're here to do. So kind of like the Buddha said, well, we're here to look at suffering, you know, and Dogen kind of says, well, you know, we're here to manifest awakening. <laughs> and if those other things are there, great. So. You know, I don't know. I think there's more than one uh, way to approach this. And I think in some ways it's why we don't always, in the modern West, we don't always hear about this. So Russ asked for the source of where we were talking about 3,000 morning activities and 800. It's, it's Shobo Genzo Jinzu, J-I-N-Z-U. There are at least a couple of translations out there. So, and, and I just think it's one of these fascicles that people don't so much choose to talk about. Now, I could be wrong about that, but I don't encounter a lot of conversation about Shobo Genzo Jinzu, um, you know, not like uh, Makahanya Haramitsu and some other ones that we talk about, right? Because I think there is this kind of like, ah, we're not supposed to believe in that stuff, <laughs> right? So I think there is some amount of skepticism. And as I say, I'm not here to say, you know, advocate for one side or the other, but I will just say for myself in my own practice, it can be helpful for me to remind myself that there may be plenty of things that I don't know about. And as soon as I cut off the possibility, then I can't see something. And our project is to see broadly, right? And to accept, you know, the functioning of this one unified reality. So it's an interesting place to practice. I, I was really not sure how this topic would go over with you all today because we don't talk about this. So it's kind of an interesting opportunity to see where we might be stuck, right? What would others like to say? I think I saw hands and people moving and <laughs> uh, was there something else somebody wanted to say or offer? Uh, Hennessy says a hand up, please. Okay. Um... So outside of whether or not this is an allegory or real or whatnot, uh, this question still applies. But, you know, I'm thinking about um, how, you know, there's discussions in Mahayana thought about skilled means and sort of the idea that like nirvana itself could be skilled means um, and that the very pursuit of it can be a hindrance. And this is making me wonder about the origin of, you know, not whether or not this is real, but why this stuff is put into scriptures so much. Like, you know, I don't think the whole message is if eyebrows aren't, if uh, light isn't coming out of your eyebrows, you're not meditating hard enough. Like, I feel like there's some sort of thing beyond that, that it's trying to convey, but at the same time, sort of that can lead to a pursuit of these things that can be hindrances and desires. And so I guess I'm like wondering in a sense of like, skilled means what benefit do you think um these writers and early scriptures were trying to get out of describing this hmm that's interesting isn't it well i mean you know so the 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 project in early buddhism was different the circumstances the culture uh were different than than what dogan is talking about or than what we see in the modern west so i think um, I don't know. I have to say, um, I'm, I'm not an expert in those early meditative practices. There was certainly some feeling that, um, 
it was a linear progression and that you had to build a certain amount of, I'll use the word power, um, and some certain amount of ability, which, you know, kind of led you to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. So, um, so there is that. The other thing we have to pay attention to, though, is early writings um, sometimes had an agenda around making people credible. So I don't know how true this was in early, early Buddhism. When it comes to China and Japan, and we hear the stories about the founder of our temple had this and such magical ability, of course, that was a PR project. Um, that was very much about saying, our temple is powerful and deserves your support because our founder was a magical guy. <laughs> Right. I mean, you know, the pattern of those stories is so similar. We know they were taken, you know, and modified and, and applied in various places. And so, you know, on the one hand, we can be a little bit skeptical about that. We know there was a there was an objective. Uh, was that what was going on in early teachings? I kind of don't think so. I mean, there, the other thing that we have to, to recall is that those early teachings were arising in a context of Vedic practice. So it's not like there was no practice and then suddenly here was the Buddha and you know he made up a lot of practices. So some of these things I'm guessing, and there may be people who know this better than I do here, uh, were in response to what was happening already, what was happening around. Because you know, within Vedic practice, and we see there's you know some some things that carry over, right? So what was the point of talking about these things? I think I can't give you a good answer for for early Buddhism, other than to say, I think there was a container, um, there was a context, just like there was, you know, in Dogen's time for what he was responding to. People thought these things were important. Um, and the other thing we have to remember is certainly, in, you know, early, in the earliest possible times, there were a lot of ways in which people felt kind of out of control, right? I mean, because a fire, a tornado, an earthquake, something could happen, a monsoon could come. You know, people kind of felt like they were out of control. The one of the ways you gain control of your surroundings is to be a wizard. You want to be able to predict and control your environment. And so, you know, we were going to take whatever we could, take advantage of whatever we could, any ability we could develop to predict and control our environment. So I've got to think that was part of it too. It's just a human experience, um, you know, and that doesn't stop as Buddhism moves down the Silk Road. By the time you get to China and Japan, you know, there's wars and famines and floods and all kinds of things. And we want to be able to predict and control our environment. So if one way that we can do that is by doing a spiritual practice and developing some kind of powers or supporting other people who are developing those powers to protect us, that feels like a pretty reasonable human approach, right? Because so much of the time for lay people, it was about supporting the monks and the monks had some ability and they, you know, were going to offer some protection. So if they were chanting for the good of the country or chanting for the good of the province or something, I mean, it was because they were assumed to have some kind of ability. So in the midst of all of that context, here comes Dogen, who's saying all of that's well and good, and that all may be true, but that, you know, manifesting awakening is something else. I'm not sure I've helped you. <laughs> I'm kind of doing a stream of consciousness here. And if there's other people who know something and want to add in, please do that. Edo, is your hand up? <laughs> yes, please go ahead. Let me call on my Dharma sister here. <laughs> well, it's not in direct response to what you're saying here. Um, maybe indirectly, it's about, uh, well, I'll just, I have an example, an example came to my mind. Uh, I have a Dharma friend who, who knows that she's going to um, have another life. And um, when she told me that, my first response was a silent response, but it was very adamant that, well, that's nice, but I'm not. <laughs> and then I realized, you know, that my, sort of belief, my adamant belief was sort of as strong as hers. And, um, and so then my actual response was, uh, so it, it awakened me to realizing that, well, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I have no idea. Um, so I don't need to have a belief about it. I don't need to take a stance. I just, I don't know. And, um, uh, but also I thought, uh, what difference does it make? <laughs> I mean, does that idea, is that going to make any difference in my life? Um, uh, I didn't have the answer to that either, um, but it was interesting. It was just interesting. My response 
was just as much a belief as her was hers was a belief you know mine, mine was just probably a more contemporary scientific you know um and uh based on nothing <laughs> and um and and i had a strong reaction you know like well she's wrong and i'm right and then it was a great um realization to re to come to realize that well i don't know i have no idea there's no reason to take a stance about this and um and it's okay i mean my my um it's, it's okay if i don't know and i don't take a stance about it uh there's still the question of how i'm going to live my life which is not dependent on that idea or belief but it was just interesting that's all <laughs> well you know a lot of westerners have that kind of response when it comes time to do liturgy and they think, you know, why are we bowing to statues and chanting with all this wacky stuff? And, you know, we're chanting in Sino Sanskrit and Sanskrit is supposed to be a magical language. And what is that about? And, you know, when they get to the Daihi Shin Dharani and someone says, well, you know, what does that mean? And I say, well, it's a spell. Dharanis are spells, they're magical spells. <laughs> and they go, you know, what are we doing? <laughs> Right. So I, I, that's the point where when somebody said, you know, isn't can't it be a hindrance that we I, it was Sawyer's that, you know, can't it be a hindrance that we actually kind of have that reaction? Um, I try to help people when when they're at that point, they're saying, you know, what's the point of that? Well, that's a chance to see our reaction. You know, that's a chance to say, uh, do we need to cut things off? Of course, you know, traditionally, this whole thing about is there, now I want to get sidetracked because we could spend a whole day talking about this, this whole thing about is there another life or not has to do with our karma, right? If I'm doing something in this life, which means that my next life will not be so good, then it does affect the way I live this particular life. Yes. So whether or not we believe that, you know, could potentially have some effect for the Chinese, for instance, life was all about this, this you know, what happens here on this planet right now, um, you know, in other places that was different. So we see lots of various streams of, you know, in Buddhism about how that happens. But yeah, it's a real, you know, when we encounter teachings about things like mystical powers, you know, we have more than one reaction because on the one hand we go, eh, you know, that's not what we're here to do. That, that's, that's, you know, crazy superstitious stuff out of another culture. And they think, wait a minute, this is Dogen. You know, I mean, like, we believe Dogen. <laughs> We think he's a great teacher. You know, we try to do everything he says, and now he's telling us about spiritual powers. Like, what's going on, right? So it's a real opportunity for us, I think, to to look closely at our response to these things. And I'm not here to tell anybody how to think about that, but it can. I think this Dharma gate is a Dharma gate in more than one way. <laughs> what would other people like to say? I thought I saw another hand up or two. Um, Brian, please. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Um, the, this, I mean, what a fascinating uh, talk and 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 subject. So I've just, yeah, so many so many thoughts bouncing around. But tying some of or or along the lines of what some other people have said um, to Hennis's question, um, I I know a lot more about the Chinese realm than I do about the Japanese side or the Indian side. But um, in Dogen's time, certainly there was. Um, you know, there were shamanic practices, there were Taoist practices, and I mean, there, it would have been very common to have this all uh, floating around there. So it, it would be not surprising at all that it would make sense to, to address these, these things. Um, but that, uh, and Hoko, what you were saying about, you know, getting into the mindset of the, of the culture at that time, I think is very, um, relevant too, because one of the, uh, you know, we, we come at it, of course, from our, our modern minds and our cultures and so on, but one of the, I think, very distinctive things um, from, say, Dogen's time, at least in China, is that there, the line, the, there weren't so sharp lines. So even this, um, even to me, what I'm thinking of, and, and you know, in this talk today, you're talking about like Dogen doing these common things and this flipping back and forth between the magical and the and the common. The big question, the, the interesting thing is, where do you draw that line? And and what does why do, there's no difference, right? And how you would approach your practice, whether uh, this is uh, creating a magical thing or I'm just doing an ordinary thing. So I think it, you know, kind of like self-destructs at some point 
um, when you think of, you know, like if you've ever looked at a mosquito or something and just said, well, this is, this is magic. Like how can a mosquito exist or something versus, you know, flying through the air? Well, that's okay, but it's not as, you know, it's a, mis you know, so anyway, I just think it ultimately when you sit on the cushion, as you said, I mean, we're just doing the same thing and, and what happens happens. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, of course, when we think back, you know, uh, many of the things that we commonly do and see and encounter today, 100 years ago or 300 years ago, that would have been magic. I mean, turn on a radio. What do you mean sound comes out of a box? I mean, <laughs> it's magic, right? When we think about just technology alone, alone, a lot of other things, you know, we can fly through the air today. You know, yeah, we're in an airplane or a hang glider, but, you know, that there are for for everything that we do today that seems quite commonplace you know at some point that would have seemed like magic so you know um i think you're exactly right when you say this the flipping back and forth shows us that there is no line how do we make a distinction you know how do we decide this is magic and this isn't especially when we are careful about terminology like supernatural something which is outside of reality something which is outside of nature you know, we can conceive of it, but the reality is, you know, there's no boundary, there's no separation. So I think that's, you know, part of, I think that's what Dogen's trying to get us to see. You know, if we're clinging to one little piece of reality, we can't easily see the rest, which is um, not unfamiliar territory for us, right? I mean, we, we have that teaching uh, in other places too. What would others like to say or ask? Other things this morning? Jeff, please. Yeah. Um, you asked uh, Hoko, you didn't know if, this, if it went over well. I think it went over well. <laughs> uh, I, I think you can tell from all the comments. So I don't have a comment. I, I just thought I would continue with the stream of consciousness contributions and just relate um, something that has come up in my memory several times. Uh, during your talk and then during some of the comments afterwards. And it, um, it was the, la the last line of a, um, of a, a colloquium with a scientific you know, presentation that I heard. Um, I was actually calculating, it was a long time ago, like 49 years ago. And, um, and I've, I've lived with it um, a lot. And, um, and the guy who said it, it became a friend and uh, you know, it's just it's a long legacy to it. But anyway, he, he gave this beautiful, beautiful talk in his research. And, um, and his final line was that he hoped that this kind of approach that, that he was uh, embodying in, in, in the way he did this work would um, remove some of the mystery, but none of the magic from, from the phenomenon. And it was, that came back to me. And I don't know if it'll, it'll help other people, but it's a way of acknowledging I think in a, in a similar way that you've been describing, Hoko. Um, sure, <laughs> and 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 the place of different ways of, of, um, of conducting one's life and, and and perceiving it. Yeah, good. Thank you for showing that. That's interesting. So we could have another long conversation about the difference between mystery, magical, transcendental, supernatural, right? Uh, that's another whole interesting, fruitful uh, area for conversation. So I'm thinking it's now 1121. We should probably get along and do our world peace ceremony. If anyone has any last things to say, I don't want to cut anybody off. Um, any last questions, comments, reflections? We good for now? Uh, Mark's waving his hand. This Mark. <laughs> yeah, hi, everybody. I'm usually last, aren't I? Um, yeah. It, the conversation about supernatural, you know, these powers, et cetera, they remind me of my very first, when I first started to sit with a Tibetan group, um, oh, about a long time ago. And he would, um, the Lama would always say, you know, you know, meditate, practice, um, it, it helps you. It, it, and he would start listing the benefits. It improves your mind, improves your memory. It makes you happier. And, and then I started sitting Zen and um, we had none of that. And actually, you know, you read, you know, if, if your teacher tells you that you'll get certain things out of this, you'd, you better start questioning that. 
And one of the things that really comes to mind with this and the idea of super, um, supernatural powers is it's another idea of separation. It's something that you don't have and that, you know, if you work diligently towards, you will, uh, you will eventually get that. And within our, and within our practice, it's, you know, it's what we are, you know, it seems, it seems that our practice is more of a less of your supernatural power is who you are, what you're doing right here, right now. And that, and, um, and accepting that, you know, you may, you know, you make that wonderful mistake and in that wonderful mistake, you have all those supernatural powers right then, right there. You're both here, you're both reminiscing of why you made that mistake. You're thinking why, how you can correct it. And you're also doing, continuing to do that thing that you were doing when you made that mistake. You're everything all at once right here, right now. So I, I find it quite interesting, the divergence here and how we, how we just really look in front of us at acceptance. Well, I'm glad this topic has uh, generated some uh, some thinking and some reflections. As this, I wasn't so sure, but you know, I just take the next gate <laughs> in the text. So um, it's a it's it's sometimes a challenge for me. You know, I look at these gates and go, okay, now what am I going to say about that? So I'm glad anyway that folks entered into this conversation with me today. Um, and if there are things we want to continue to talk about related to this. Um, we can certainly do that. So uh, this maybe is not the last time this topic comes up. We'll see. Okay, um, so let's close up here so that we can do our world peace ceremony. Thanks everybody for a good conversation today. I'm going to pitch back to Hoshin and let him lead our chants. <laughs>